Does one have to be born again during the dispensation of grace? So the phrase born again is a very common phrase in Christian circles. It's used all the time. People will sometimes say that they are a born again Christian. So it's, it's pretty common terminology. The question that we want to look at tonight is, does one have to be born again to be saved during the dispensation of grace? Of course, we live today during the dispensation of grace. So as we think about that question, what, what should we do to study it? Well, the first thing we should do is go to our friend, the Blue Letter Bible. And so I'm going to type in born again. Now, notice how I've done this here. I've decided to do this as a phrase. So it's going to only capture verses where born again, where both words are there and they are right next to each other in that exact order. So let's go ahead and run our search. So notice the answer. So the phrase born again appears only three times in scripture. It appears in John 3, twice, John 3, 3 and John 3, 7, and then in 1 Peter 1, verse 23. So there are no Pauline appearances of the term born again. It's not a term that is in any of Paul's writings. So maybe we could stop there. We could say, well, you know, born again is, is not a Pauline term. And so it, it must not be something that is required for us today. But let's, let's dig into this and let's think about it. So we see here two of the occurrences are in John chapter 3. That tells us that if we want to understand this term, we need to look at John chapter 3. So turn to John chapter 3 with me, if you would. John chapter 3, and let's just start in verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night. And said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So being born again is apparently required under the kingdom program. Now what does it mean? Look with me at verse 4. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Nicodemus is obviously taking what the Lord says literally. Nicodemus is asking the question, What, what, what do you mean? How can I be physically born twice? That doesn't make any sense. It's not, it's not geographically possible. Verse 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So verse 5 is clarifying, isn't it? For someone to enter into the kingdom of God, they have to be two things, born of the water and born of the Spirit. And it says born of water, actually. Well, you know what born of water is. Born of water is not a reference to water baptism. Born of water is a reference to what happens when a child is born, right? What happens is the water breaks and the baby is born as, you know, I'm not a sort of, I'll just leave it at that. So the born of water is the physical birth. And it's very clear that the born of the spirit is a subsequent spiritual birth. Verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Well, you know what that is. That's the normal physical birth. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So verses 5 and 6 fit together perfectly. Verse 7, marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof. But canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Now, here's what I want you to notice. When the Lord uses the term born again, 
I think he tells you exactly what it means. Look with me at verse 5, 6, and 8. Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, verse 6, that which is born of the Spirit, verse 8, that is born of the Spirit. So it's pretty clear the first birth is the birth of water, the birth of the flesh, the born again, the second birth, is born of the Spirit. In other words, what had to happen under the kingdom program is someone had to be spiritually born to see the kingdom of God. Now, we saw earlier that Paul doesn't use the term born again. He doesn't use that phrase. But get Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4. So Galatians chapter 4, and we're going to look at verse 28. Now, Paul never uses the term born again. We saw that. But notice what he says in Galatians 4, 28. Now, we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit... Even so, it is now. So notice what Paul does say. He talks about people that are born after the Spirit. And what did he say? Even so, it is now. What Galatians 4 says is that during the dispensation of grace, Galatians is obviously written by Paul, someone must be born after the Spirit. So does Paul use the term born again? No, he doesn't. But we just saw in John chapter 3 that what born again means is it means born of the Spirit. And Paul says, specifically in Galatians 4.29, that someone has to be born after the Spirit. So he says something awfully, awfully close. Now, I guess you could say John 3 says born of the Spirit. Galatians 4 says born after the Spirit, and maybe you find some sort of distinction in that. I mean, I, I realize that of and after are different words, but it seems to me Paul's saying something very, very similar. Get with me Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. Now, I'm not saying that Paul's gospel is the same as Peter's gospel. It's not. We know that. We've, we've covered that extensively. But is a spiritual birth required during the dispensation of grace? Well, let's look. Romans 8, verse 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. What does Romans 8, 9 tell you about someone that doesn't have the Spirit of Christ? They're lost. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Let me put it this way. What happens today to you if you don't have the Holy Spirit inside you? What does that mean? It means you're lost, right? Look with me at Romans 8, verse 14. Romans 8, verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. How can you tell if someone is a son of God? Well, if they're led by the Spirit. If someone is not led by the Spirit, what are they not? They're not a son of God. Verse 16, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. How do you know you're a, children of God, a child of God? The Spirit bears witness witness. Get with me 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now what we're seeing in these verses simply is this. Can you actually be a member of the body of Christ today without the Holy Spirit? Is that possible? And what I'm going to sh show you what these verses are clearly saying is it's not possible. It's an impossibility. If you're in the body of Christ today 
It's because the Holy Spirit puts you there and the Holy Spirit dwells inside you. If the Holy Spirit doesn't dwell inside you, then you're lost, my friend, and you need to believe the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If the Holy Spirit doesn't dwell in you, you're not saved. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 2. This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? And of course, the answer is the hearing of faith. Now think about that just for a moment. Received ye the Spirit. How did someone obtain the Holy Spirit? Well, according to Galatians 3, 2, by the hearing of faith. What that means is this. When you heard the gospel and you believed it, when you had faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, death for your sin, burial and resurrection, the moment you had faith, you know what you received? You received the Spirit, according to Galatians 3, verse 2. If you didn't receive the Spirit, that means you've never had faith in the gospel. Look with me at Galatians chapter 4. Galatians chapter 4, verse 6. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So God's Spirit is in the hearts of, the, of believers, it cries, Abba, Father. And notice what the first part of the verse says, Galatians 4, 6. Because ye are sons. Hopefully what you're noticing is as we look at verse after verse after verse is you're not saved without the Holy Spirit. If you have the hearing of faith, if you have believed the gospel, you know what you received? You received the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that places you into the body of Christ. Look with me at Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. And look with me at verse 4. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Well, what does the word regeneration mean? Well, it means re again generation, birth, rebirth. So does a lost man have to be regenerated to be saved? Titus 3, 5 says, yes. Look at what it says. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. How? By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Now, let's look at our friend here, the Webster's 1828 Dictionary. I'm going to go to the top here and just type in the word regeneration, and let's see what it pulls up. So look with me at this. I'm going to get this to scroll here if I can. In theology, this is definition two, new birth by the grace of God. Regeneration is a new birth. And that birth, obviously, is a spiritual birth by the Holy Spirit. So let me pull together what we've looked at so far. We're trying to figure out, does a believer today need to be born again during the dispensation of grace? Well, if you run the, the phrase born again, you're not going to find Paul use it. He doesn't use that exact terminology. But when you study John 3, you realize that the term born again means 
born of the Spirit because it says it three times. Paul specifically says in Galatians 4 that someone has to be born after the Spirit even as it is now. During the dispensation of grace, does one have to have a spiritual birth? Yes, one does. The point of John 3, when, when the Lord says to Nicodemus, you must be born again, and Nicodemus doesn't understand what born again means, the Lord tells him specifically, you have to be born of the Spirit. The first physical birth was not enough. Well, what does Paul say in Galatians 4? You have to be born after the Spirit. And what did he say in these multiple verses in Romans and Corinthians and Galatians? Well, if you have the hearing of faith, if you believe the gospel, what happens to you? You receive the Spirit. How do you get saved according to Titus? You get saved by the washing of regeneration. That is a spiritual birth. So my, my, me personally, you can decide for yourself. When someone uses the phrase born again today, I don't have a hissy fit about it. I realize the term is in John. I realize Paul doesn't use that term. What I understand is I understand what they're saying is you need to have a spiritual birth. And does someone need to have a spiritual birth today to be saved? Yes, they do. Paul says that time and time and time again. Now, my concern, you can decide for yourself, the use of the term born again today doesn't bother me because people have to have a spiritual birth. But here is the greater issue. The greater issue today is the corruption of the gospel. What do I mean by that? So look with me at Ephesians 2 and Romans 11. Ephesians chapter 2 and Romans 11. Now, Ephesians 2 is a passage that is familiar, but let's look at it together. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. What Ephesians 2 is saying is this. You're saved by grace and not works. And it says that in, in multiple different ways. For by grace, grace is unmerited favor. It's unearned blessing. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's not your works. It's not your striving. It's not your effort. It is the gift of God. Well, you don't work for a gift. A gift is something someone gives you that you just receive. And verse 9 that specifically says, not of works. So the purpose of Ephesians 2, 8, 9 is to tell you again and again and again that salvation has nothing to do with, with works. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Okay? Don't add anything to it. Now, notice with me Romans 11, verse 6. Romans 11, verse 6. Romans 11, verse 6, and I want to go to Romans 3 afterwards, if I remember. Now, Romans 11 is my favorite scriptural tongue twister. Are you ready? So, Romans 11, 6, And if by grace, then is it no more of works? Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace? Otherwise, work is no more work. Now, the reason I like that verse so much is what I find in talking to people about the gospel is they believe that God saves by grace, but. In other words, God saves by grace, but you got to live it. God saves by grace, but you got to quit sinning. God saves by grace, but you can lose it if you do this, that, or the other. And, and what they believe, at least what they say, is that salvation is 90% grace. But there's 10% that you got to do. You got to quit your sinning. You got to get water baptized. You got to start going to church. You got to start tithing. You got to be kind to your fellow man. All of those things are works 
Ephesians 2.9 said, not of works. And what Romans 11.6 says is, if by grace, then is it not of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. Think about this with me just for a moment. Grace is this pure, unadulterated gift. And if you add one work to it, it ceases to be grace. Think about this with me for a moment. When God offers you eternal life as a free gift, what he's essentially saying to you is, let me give you $10 trillion and you don't have to do anything. You just have to receive it by faith. And you say, well, it can't be that easy. I need to get water baptized. As if your water baptism now entitles you to $10 trillion. Or you say, well, no, 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 I have to give up smoking. I have to start tithing. Do you see what an insult it is to the grace of God and to the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ if you take God's grace and you add one of your measly works to it? Doesn't that suggest that God's grace is incomplete? It was 99.9% .9 good, but then your church membership sealed the deal. Do you realize how insane that is? That is an insult to the grace of God. Look with me at Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. Where is boasting then? You remember what Ephesians 2, 8, 9 said, lest any man should boast. Romans 3, 27, where is boasting then? It is excluded by what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. I'll tell you what concerns me. I've talked to multiple people over the years that when I ask them, if God were to say to you, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? And too many people answer that question with, I'm basically a good person. I've been water baptized. I joined a church. I already have a church. I've done this. I give to the poor. Everything they're saying is a work. And what they're doing is boasting. Here's what I've done. Everything you've done is totally inadequate. Your righteousness is worth Zippo. In fact, your righteousness is going to get you sent to hell if you don't believe the gospel, right? That's the way it works. So my greatest fear about the gospel is this. There's a lot of very kind, decent, churched people. They're very pleasant, and you can't tell the difference from the outside. But if you haven't trusted in the shed blood of Christ alone, you're not saved. You have to have faith in his shed blood and nothing else. It's not his shed blood plus something that you do. Now, let me give you a word of encouragement if I could. If you understand right division, if you understand Paul's gospel, then hopefully you have clarity on these things. And that means you can present the gospel clearly to others. You know why that matters? We're living through an age right now where people are unsettled. They're unhappy with things in life. They're, they're fearful. They're concerned. And they are looking for answers. Well, the answer, quite simply, is this. The answer is the same today as what it has always been. The answer is Jesus Christ. The answer is faith in his shed blood as the full and sufficient payment for our sins. We in the body of Christ have the privilege to tell people about that. God will give us opportunities to speak the gospel to others, and let's take those. Let's do that. What a blessed labor that is. So if I could just encourage you in that regard, we have a, a very glorious home in heaven that awaits us. Our victory over this world is assured but let's do what we can during the time that we have so that we might bring others to faith in the gospel. Amen? Amen.